So I should explain the synchronicities, but I'll get there, I'll get there. Do you ever have those times in your life where you're just like, what in the heck is going on? I just had one of those recently. I got to interview somebody I never thought I'd get the chance to speak to, and it's astrologer Mark Borax. He and I spoke for about an hour, so this is part one of two videos that I'm gonna share with you. He's talking about so many incredible things, you will not wanna miss one minute of it. He's the author of this book that I really love. It's 2012, Crossing the Bridge to the Future. So he's the author of a brand new book called The Ruby Heart of the Dragon, which is a sun sign book. He does something really interesting that I've never seen before, where he mixes sun signs with the nodes, the north and the south nodes. Mark Borax is a fascinating, fascinating astrologer. He is part of a lineage that goes way back to Mark Edmund Jones, who was one of the creators of the Sabian symbols. He was the teacher of his teacher. He also taught Dane Rudyard. So this, this lineage goes Mark Edmund Jones, Dane Rudyard, Elias Lonsdale, Mark Borax. And so throughout Mark Borax's life, he's gone to this point where he became an astrologer apprentice and now he's the master astrologer. So he's got such a cool story. In his sun sign book, The Ruby Heart of the Dragon, there are all these stories. So it's not like a typical astrology cookbook where you look up your sun sign, what this, what's that, what's that, what's that, blah, 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 blah. It's more like, hey, let's get to know in depth what these signs actually are. It's important to know what these signs actually are because we have all 12 of them ruling one part of our life. Each person has each sign. So understanding all these signs is critical to really understanding ourselves, know thyself. That's one of those tenets, right? I hope you enjoyed part one of my interview with Mark Borax and look out for part two coming soon. Hey. Hi. Where are you? San Diego area. Okay. And you're in Vermont, yeah? I am. Yeah. I've been enjoying looking at your 2012 book again this morning. I was reading more of it, and I just feel like I've been talking to you already this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and um, of course, your new book, and I'm super excited to talk about all of these things with you. For The Ruby Heart of the Dragon, you say that each chapter is designed like a travel log. Nobody writes astrology like this. That's why I'm so focused on making sure people get your books and get your message because astrology is more than just, oh, love, wealth, money. You know, it's more about let's look back in time or let's look at these processes or where is this going to lead us in the future? It's just so much more um, intertwined. It's, it's like multidimensional. And I don't think many people are talking about it like this. Yeah. And, and that book was, um, it was a labor of love. It, it not only took four years and three months to write seven days a week. It took my whole life to write. So yeah. really I pushed my writer's art and I pushed my astrologer's art farther than either one had ever gone. I, I, I really fought um, like a shamanic journey to, to clear away other people's um, stuff about the signs and my own stuff and Elias's stuff. And, and, uh, and in a way, especially Elias's because when I first stumbled into his mystery school, when he first created that mystery school that I wrote about in 2012, mm. under the great redwood trees of the Santa Cruz Mountains, we were taught uh, what he called the Atlantean Zodiac that he recovered from a dream of Atlantis, which totally scrambles the signs. And so they have a different order. They go with different planets. They go with different houses. But I respected Elias so much because of what he had done for me in that first reading that I instantly let go of my hold on the normal Zodiac. But it wasn't until four years ago when I chose to write this book for a mass readership that I chose, I'm not going to use the Atlanta, the wacky Atlantean order. <laughs> Because I already have to win readers over as a somewhat unknown, slightly famous author <laughs> of my own around the world. And, and I don't want to throw an extra block in there to have to win them over even more. Because mm -hmm. uh, my views of each sign are already off the map of what almost anyone else would ever say, even though I also still honor kind of um, maybe some uh, common understanding. But what I found was I had to go back to the point where I met Elias. Yeah. It's almost like I had to neutralize him out of the picture. Mm -hmm. And then this is where I'm go this is where I was at the time I met him. But from not having let myself into the traditional zodiac 
for 30 years, when I let myself back in, it was teeming with new energies of everything I had learned since then. This is from the 2012 book. And it's where uh, he was talking, Elias was talking to you about becoming a great astrologer. And he says, to be real in astrology, I have to say, it's not easy. You have to be willing to change your mind every day. You have to never think you know anything. Every fake astrologer thinks they know what Geminis are like. To me, the idea I should know what a Gemini is like is awful. If I did, I'd go around like a robot with my head saying Gemini, 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 and it wouldn't mean anything. The thing that stood out to me like about that is that I feel like that's where your book goes. It's like a new um, vision. Feels like you're just you're you're in a deep ocean of this wisdom that you've experienced, and now you're collecting it back of your own experience with it, and then now you're sharing it out. So I just I love that there's sort of a bridge there. Yeah, and thank you again for pointing that out because that advice that Elias gave me the day we met um, became my code. It became my mantra. I wouldn't be able to do astrology any other way than that. Even if I tried really hard to, <laughs> I, I can't like, I can't look at your birth chart today. If I was going to give you a reading today and then I can't look at it again tomorrow or in 10 years and duplicate the reading that I gave you today, I'm, I'm physically incapable of it. Mm. And, and so that version of what I call star jazz, because it's it's really astrology like jazz more than rock or classical. Mm -hmm. Because with rock and classical, um, you're pretty much duplicating, especially uh, successful rock musicians. If they have a hit song, when they go on tour, they sign these agreements with the record company. They have to play the guitar solo note for note the same <laughs> way as on the album. Mm -hmm. And that would drive me crazy. I'm a musician. Yeah. I'm much more like the Grateful Dead. I mean, <laughs> I'll fall flat a hundred times for a hundred and one time to transcend. I don't care. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, and like yeah. with jazz music, it's star jazz. So that information he gave me um, due to our personal connection or the spirit forces that preside over my work, I don't know. It made it so I can't tran I can't transcend his knowledge. I, I, I have to do it that way. Yeah. And it's improvisational. Like you said, that astrology jazz, and that's something that is, makes it so much more authentic too. And it releases a lot of the, um, the hold on doing things the right way, or Gemini is like this, you know, which is, what's just so interesting because your book, the Ruby heart of the dragon is a sun sign book and you integrated the nodes as well, which I find really interesting because that's part of that was part of your reading that you had with him is that he went straight away to that. It was like, okay, well, here's your sun sign, but here's your issue is through your square to the nodes, right? Yes. And so what made you choose to because I've I think I've never seen that as a part of a sun sign book. I really loved that. Thank you. Well, first of all, the way the book came about was about five years ago, one of my graduate students chose to transcribe four classes I had taught. And, and in that course, I break down, as Ellis taught us to, the 12 signs in relation to the four minds of star genesis. The four minds have the same names as the Jungian minds, but they're not wow. really connected to the Jungian minds. They're just, okay. they just have the same name. So we have perceptual mind signs and judgment mind signs and actual mm -hmm. mind and emotive mind. And my uh, student, who I uh, thank in, in, in the acknowledgments in my book, uh, Alejandra Sophia, she chose to take it upon herself to transcribe four classes I had taught on the four minds and the 12 signs. She submitted her transcripts to me for corrections and editing. But I found myself not just correcting and editing, but expounding on them and mm -hmm. enlarging them. And that, for the first time ever, led me to think I, maybe I'm ready to finally write a book on the 12 signs. I think somewhere along the line, I came up with the idea, the ruby heart of the dragon, mm -hmm. because I was thinking of the dragon's tail, which is the Arabian astrologer's name for the south node of the moon, where you're coming from yeah. in past lives and in this life, between the dragon's tail of the south node and the dragon's head of the North Node, which is where you're trying to get to, the son of a person could be an envisioned 
almost in between, like it would be in the heart of the dragon's body. Oh, I'm glad you explained that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And ruby works really well because it's from a ruby that they create laser beams. Ah, and so cool. when you ignite your ruby heart sun sign, it can shine a laser beam like through the mouth of the dragon or the eyes of the dragon on that territory up ahead. And it could also shoot a laser beam towards your past issues and help. Yeah. You know. Tell me what you think about when somebody has their south node, maybe in their ascendant, conjunct their ascendant. If somebody has a south node near their ascendant, yeah, um, it's it's one of those lives where pa some past life, some particular past life, or in general, past life unresolved issues uh, overshadow your experience in this life where you, mm. you you're not quite yet living fully in the present time of your body until you deal with some of those issues. The, the truth is, when you when you go into the birth chart on a soul level, mm. you could get to something as potent as past lives through any part of the chart. Mm. But in general, the, the first places I start to look for sure, the first place I almost always start to look is the degree of their south node, especially in the book of degrees that I have, um, Star Sparks, uh, Lonsdale's interpretation mm. of the degrees, which uh, it's one of his unpublished books, but he published oh. the same thing recently. And I think it's called something like 360, 360 somethings by L.S. Lonsdale. Mm -hmm. uh, that in, he he continued the work of his teacher, Mark Edmund Jones. Right. Jones pioneered degree work. Exactly. Uh, by sitting down with a woman in San Diego, yeah. actually at Balboa Park, um, L.C. Wheeler. LC, what? Elsie Wheeler. Yeah. Elsie Wheeler. Yeah. And and he he had uh, shuffled 360 index cards with the name of one degree on the back of the cards that she couldn't see. And he would hold the blank face to her. She would channel an image. And he went through the entire shuffle deck till he got 360 image, which which became the, the Sabian symbols. Yes. And um, he and then Rudyard. Um, got even more famous in interpreting them. By the way, Elias told me that Jones wasn't happy with Rudyard's description <laughs> of the degrees. Just, really? just, just a little inside story there. Um, but the whole world mostly knows the Sabian symbols through Rudyard. Yes. Um, they were a little different than Jones. But Elias took the Chandra symbols, which is another set of symbols channeled by the astrologer Jan John Sandbach, Mm. Um, in the 1970s and Elias took sandbox images and channeled completely new meanings for them oh. which is the deepest degree information ever done it's just every astrologer should know about that book so yeah you should get that book but anyway in that really? source the, my first step when I'm hunting down past lives during a reading is is to look at the degree of the south node and and with Jones's version of degree work, you always round up. Yeah, that's how that's how I do it too. And I, I'm I'm very very interested in the Sabian symbols, and I loved that there the the that's part of that lineage that you know you're you're following through with that, and also that you brought up Elsie Wheeler. And I was going to ask about um, Sarah's uh, Sarah and Theana, which she became later. Her input was there too. So I was thinking how. These two major works were a combination of a, a man and a woman or a yin and a yang energy to birth something very um, profound. And uh, yeah. that kind of correlates with what you are looking for in 2012. What you mentioned is like the search for love and con connection in a way, right? And also in your your new book, is that's thematic as well. And I just wondered if you could, what you thought about that and how when we connect with another person, that's like harmonics between two people and it can birth something. Yes. Yeah. What the Sufis have a beautiful word for that, that they call sokhbet and mm -hmm. uh, it's S-O-H-B-E-T. And sokhbet is based on the connection that Rumi had with Shams, his teacher and his mm -hmm. lover. And that when two people connect, 
in a way that's deep and real and potent and multidimensional, the world can change through their connection. Even before I knew that idea, um, that's how I was always living my life. I, 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 I was five years old when I started searching for my life partner. Consciously. <laughs> I, you know, that's what I was after. I, I was after the goddess. And like I say a bit in my new book, The, the Ruby Heart of the Dragon, it has its strengths and weaknesses. You know, <laughs> there was an illusion and there was a truth. And, um, and I'm still working, you know, I'm still working to sort the illusion of that love dyad from the truth of it. The beauty of astrology, the beauty of the soul level astrology that I created is that I don't get to read somebody's chart at a safe professorial distance yeah. in a detached way. I have mm. to fall in love with them. Yeah. And, and 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 then I get inside the chart and I'm kind of talking about you from being inside you yeah. and telling you what I sense and see and what I feel. And um, that's just the only way I, I, I know how to do it. And, and so for me, um, there's something uh, about any human that I could probably fall in love with enough to read their mm -hmm. chart. You know, you can find somebody's story, turn around somebody's karma, um, envision their nightmares from uh from a distance because as deep as i go into your karma and your unresolved issues i'm still me it's not really my issues i mean it might be overlap there's going <laughs> to yeah. be some overlap mm -hmm. and and so um i'm kind of answering your question did, did that answer your question oh yeah absolutely yeah i'm just thinking about synastry and degrees because when for example you know you have the nine degree Libra and then Elias's teacher had the nine degree Libra and have you noticed when you give readings if you find that there's some synastry between a degree that you have and a person you're reading do you feel like you can more profoundly reach into their experience or is it yes pretty much the yeah. same okay yeah often I do and and it's um also when I'm looking at charts of of a couple like either lovers or uh, yeah. father daughter or whatever um i'm i'm searching to see if there are any shared degrees because yeah. because i look at that more than just a conjunction if they have an exact same degree in common and having been led that deeply into the greek the degrees through elias's star sparks um for the last 20 years um oftentimes that is where i find uh, a deep resonance in myself with mm -hmm. with somebody else whose chart i'm looking at wow that's really cool. The next thing I wanted to ask you about was the age of Aquarius. So the 2012 book, Crossing the Bridge to the Future, uh, I, I think it's just the coolest book because you just have so much information, not only your story, but it's the transcripts, right? From the mystery school, which was just such a special moment in time and that you bring us all into that mystery school, which mystery schools, can you tell us a little bit about what that even means in my case the mystery school was a, a cottage in the redwoods in bonnie dune california north of santa cruz um, where after elias whose name was william lonsdale gave me um, my first reading that he gave me which was in december of 1987 uh, i was on fire to study with him to become his apprentice mm. uh, i could I, I couldn't imagine how he knew what he knew. And, um, and, and the day that he gave me my reading, which I do describe in my 2012 book, um, I said to myself, I need to learn how to do for others what this guy just did for me. So I started bugging him and he was saying, uh, we're not teaching again. We don't have any plans yet to teach again. We've recently taught classes, he and his wife. Um, and, but I kept, you know, I kept my, my ear to the local Santa Cruz hotline. And, and then it turned out a couple of years later after I started bugging him. Yeah, about a little more than two years later, I guess, yeah. after my reading. Mm -hmm. They did start holding classes. Um, I think it was Monday nights each week in their cottage under the Redwoods. And a mm -hmm. bunch of us would drive there every Monday night and, and sit around and learn and ask questions. And so for me, 
that version of mystery school was partly a resuscitation and a, and a continuance of ancient mystery schools because it felt as though Elias had a, a psychic connection that seemed partly based on some of his past lives mm -hmm. and partly based on something else he has where kind of like Rudolf Steiner or Edgar Cayce, yeah. um, there's these rare individuals who there's probably not that many of them at any given time alive at, at the same time in history, who their ability to contact other sources is um, staggering. And the information that they bring through is is unparalleled. And so uh, it, it all it felt to a lot of us under under the redwood trees 30 years ago that this was a a resuscitation and a continuity with things that must have been taught in mystery schools. This wasn't the first time we were all doing this. Wow. And um and now flash forward to um 2008 when my 2012 book came out. Mm -hmm. It spread word of my work um, around the world because the book became successful and uh, more people started hearing about me and my work than ever before. And mm -hmm. that's what launched the College of Visionaries and Wizards informally. I call it a mystery school because I feel that um, a lot of sacred names get bandied about too casually and uh, and just for just for cachet and you know just to give myself some extra boost so so i just call it the college of visionaries and wizards which is kind of a cool modern name yeah uh, uh, but it's a mystery school and in in there i'm basically teaching students how to live by the soul one of your recent youtube videos you were talking about mark edmund jones springing the birth chart from the fate like device to the active blueprint so is that sort of what you are pursuing in your practice? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah that that was Jones and and Rudyard's big and Rudyard. contribution. Before Jones came along in the 1920s and and then Rudyard shortly after becoming his apprentice, astrologers really still were looking at the birth chart with a medieval lens. Yeah, fatalism, birth, right? That's right. The, you know, Saturn was the greater malefic and, mm -hmm. you know, it, it had all, it had all that de de almost demonic yes. sense to it. And, and, and what Jones and, and then Rudyard did uh, that Elias picked up and ran with even more was not looking at the birth chart as if it depicts who you are, but who you might be. All and, the potential. Yeah. That's in there. Yeah, and that doesn't sound like an earth-shaking revelation right now to most young people who are just <laughs> discovering astrology. It's like, of course, yeah. but it was like, you know, it was a huge change. That's one of the parts in 2012 that I made a note of is during during a conversation about 2012 and that that switch over, like that ramp up to the age of Aquarius, there was a student who was asking about about that fatalism versus free will. And if there is fatalism, if these things are predicted, then what's the point? Like it's going to happen anyway, who cares what we do? And the response was something like, well, it's volunteer work. You have to do your part. And that now we're going into this period where, um, the 2012 feels like it could have been a marker or 2008 when you were writing or 2000, probably six or seven, when you were writing the book. That's when the things I think were changing as far as you know technology in our world and the cell phones that were smartphones coming through. And that wasn't part of the story when you know you were in the school with Sarah and Elias or William. So what do you think they would say now or what do you say now about that change? Like the 2012 feels like that was probably the point when the technology was really everybody had their smartphones. Yeah. Well, on a personal level, one thing I have to say about it is neither Elias nor I have a cell phone. So I've resisted that urge, you know, sometimes my children and once in a while my wife are, you know, getting on my case for that. <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, it goes against the norm. It, in some ways, it makes it makes our life a little trickier. Like many such technological breakthroughs, 
that the current age of information and um and devices is a mixed blessing mm -hmm. i don't i do not look at it as all bad no uh, i mean we we're here talking to each other across the country right. we, i mean yeah yeah absolutely what a miracle that you're yeah. in san diego and you know i'm in vermont and we get to talk and and certainly for um somebody who's who's self-published for the first time because um the Ruby Heart of the Dragon, I published myself instead oh, wow. of going with North Atlantic and Ran Random House. I've thrown my hat into the self-publishing arena. And so I'm indebted to Amazon and things like that I might have um, a lot of misgivings about. I just bit the bullet and decided I'm going to go as far as I can with this, short of having a cell phone. <laughs> um, I, I'm doing as much as I can to use the technologies because they're out there yeah. and I do want the world to know to know of my book. So I just try and work to reduce my own dependence on having to always be on the computer, mm -hmm. to, to spend more time with my kids, uh, uh, with the one child who's living at home now, who's 14 years old. Ah, um, I have a 14 year old too. Uh, yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> <Good times. laughs> oh, and yeah. you know and even with my cats and my wife and here in this yeah. little Vermont paradise too Beautiful. so yeah I try and use it as as responsible as responsibly as I can and um and also speak out against it a few places in the new book I I bring technology to the fore you know and I mm. I, I I I sound off about it in my own way